Hi there, everyone. Thanks very much for um, for signing into the webinar. Um, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll just wait for a few more people to uh, to connect. But it looks like we've got a lot of people, so I'm very excited. And yeah, we will start shortly. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ASME and Nuclear Energy Insiders webinar on advanced manufacturing, cutting schedule and costs from SMR construction. My name is Kevin Anderson. I'm the organizer for this webinar, uh, but it was produced in association with the um, Association of American Society for Mechanical Engineers. As you may know already, I'm responsible for the International SMR and Advanced Reactor Summit 2019 taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, on April the 2nd and the 3rd. This is one of several pieces of work we're doing to promote the industry and some of the key issues within it. We also have multiple white papers which are available through our website too. So there are actually over 300 of you signed up today to listen to the webinar, which is brilliant. So thanks very much for the great response and thank you in advance to our panelists for their time. Just a brief little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, the webinar will be about 45 minutes. We'll start with um, an introduction from uh, Bob, uh, Bob from IOD Power on ASME. Then we'll move on to uh, David Gandhi from EPRI. Then we'll move on to Dr. Chana uh, from TWI. Uh, yeah, so we'll take about 45 minutes and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. There should be a question box in front of you. Don't be afraid to submit any questions. Um, we'd love to hear as many as possible. Um, and if we don't get through them in the webinar in time, we will submit them to the panelists afterwards and get some, some answers from them afterwards as well. So yeah, please don't be afraid. Uh, so yeah, just a quick one uh, joining uh, me on the on the webinar today are uh, Bob Stakenborg, uh, he's the general manager from ILD Power. Um, we've got David Gandhi, he's a senior technical executive at EPRI, and we've got Dr. Chana Nagaswaran, who's a core research program manager at TWI. Uh, with EPRI and ASME speaking and sponsoring in Atlanta this April. Uh, if you'd like to meet them, then do please join us. Uh, we have a website, uh, it's called nuclearenergyinsider.com. Uh, look for the International SMR and Advanced Reactor Summit and you'll find us nice and easily. Um, like I said, please do submit those questions because we do love to uh, challenge our panelists as much as possible. Um, so now, although I'd like to think it's so, I'm pretty sure people didn't sign up to the webinar to listen to me. Uh, so without further ado, Bob, I will hand over to you, Bob. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Bob Stackenborg, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for the NEI ASME webinar on advanced manufacturing uh, for small modular reactors. A little bit of my background, I've been involved in the commercial nuclear power industry in the U.S. since 1980. All of my years have been spent in design, engineering, and management at consulting firms, uh, including Bechtel, Stone & Webster, Sergeant Lundy, and others. I'm currently the general manager of ILD. We're a small nuclear consulting firm located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we do engineering work throughout the U.S. fleet of plants. So over my career, I've watched the U.S. Uh, nuclear power industries in their heyday when we had 6,000 engineers in one office working on construction of 6,000 megawatt and larger plants dwindle down to where we were about 10 years ago, which was no new construction, closing operating plants, et cetera. In many respects, we're not out of those woods yet. In 2007, I decided that I needed to give back a little bit to the industry that kept me and my family fed for all those years. So I joined the uh, ASME Nuclear Engineering Division, or NED, to work with some like-minded individuals. The Nuclear Engineering Division works to host the International Conference of Nuclear Engineering every year, along with our partners in Japan, China, and the European Union. So over the last several years, we have worked as a group to keep nuclear power alive in the U.S., and we're now expanding our ASME portfolio events to include a nuclear forum and other activities like this webinar. So which brings us to the topic of the webinar, which is advanced manufacturing in small modular reactors and small modular reactors itself. 
So uh, everyone started hearing about SMR several years ago. So we watched their development with, um, you know, with, with good intent. At this point, I think the SMR may be the best hope for future nuclear construction in the U.S. and in many countries abroad as well. Their economics seem to make a lot of sense, particularly when comparing them to uh, VC Summer and Vogel construction with their cost overruns and schedule overruns, et cetera. At that time, after, after they had decided that Summer was going to shut down, I thought nuclear power was likely dead in the U.S. But then along comes a move for carbon-free power, and the whole nuclear picture changed. Uh, someone mentioned to me a few days ago that Greenpeace was actually pro-nuclear. And so after doing my due diligence, I verified that that actually is fake news. The Greenpeace is still dead set against nuclear, but there are many other folks like Bill Gates, who you might have heard, is now putting in his own money in favor of nuclear power over other more conventional forms of electrical production. This alone could be a huge factor in favor of nuclear power and the small modular reactor. What I found fascinating about small modular reactors, other than their inherent safety features and what I think makes them most appealing, is the ability to modularize their construction. The modularization gets you to shorter licensing and construction times and therefore much better economics. But even though the units are small and somewhat affordable, they are still complicated pieces of machinery that require lengthy manufacturing schedules. But their smaller size is the key that unlocks their potential. So how do you fix this manufacturing schedule and cost? Well, you add in advanced manufacturing techniques, which all seem to be happening at just about the right time. Since the major components, like the reactor vessel, are smaller in scale and thus more manageable in size, recent advances in powder metallurgy, electron beam welding, and other advanced manufacturing techniques make it possible to take the lengthy manufacturing schedules for major components down from multiple years to a much more manageable, maybe a year or less, for some of these components like the reactor vessel. And that's where I first heard of this program that EPRI is working on and what this webinar is all about. EPRI asked a simple basic question, how do you drive the manufacturing times and costs down for major nuclear reactor components? And hopefully we're about to learn that answer. So with that, let me introduce our first uh, panelist, who is uh, David Gandy. He's a senior technical executive in EPRI's nuclear materials area, where he is responsible, in addition to other things, for technical oversight of major projects on advanced manufacturing and fabrication, powder metallurgy, advanced welding, next generation, erosion-resistant alloys, additive manufacturing, and small modular reactor fabrication. So, David? Yes, thank you, Bob. So, as, as Bob indicated, uh, EPRI and the Department of Energy and a number of other folks are involved right now in looking at a number of advanced manufacturing technologies, and I'm going to try and go through a, a couple of those to uh, just share with you some of the experience that we've had over the last year and a half or so, and where we're actually trying to go with the program. Uh, to set the stage for the discussion, I'm going to go through about five technologies which are shown on the top of the screen uh, in some detail. There are a number of other advanced technologies that are being used for uh, manufacturing uh, that I won't touch on. Those are kind of highlighted in gray at the bottom of the screen, but I really want to touch on powder metallurgy and hot isostatic pressing. Uh, some of the advanced welding and joining techniques, including electron beam welding, uh, diode laser cladding techniques, which we're currently using in our program. Uh, you've all heard a lot about additive manufacturing. We'll touch on that also and some of the advanced machining and metrology work that's ongoing. So to begin the discussion, I want to kind of highlight what we're trying to accomplish in the EPRI DOE program, uh, I'd like to indicate, first of all, that there are a number of other partners involved in this program, predominantly the uh, uh, Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Center in the UK, as well as uh, New Scale Power, which is uh, obviously here in the US. The program that we have in place is looking at manufacturing the New Scale or parts of the new scale reactor uh, using various manufacturing techniques at a two-third scale. So to give you some idea, this is about six feet in diameter. We're manufacturing the assembly that's shown on the right screen, uh, right-hand side of the screen, 
and the assembly that's shown in the middle part of the screen. And we'll go through some of that in just a moment. So first, let me introduce you to pattern metallurgy. I think many of you are probably aware of the technology, but don't really have a feel for where it's being used and why we would be looking at it for nuclear reactor applications. Uh, first of all, pattern metallurgy allows you to make com <clears throat> very complex components uh, at a very near net shape. So by making those at a near net shape, you can reduce the overall machining cost as well as the volume of material that you utilize to produce that component. So uh, you essentially start with a powder and a capsule or a can that's manufactured to the size of the component that you're trying to produce. Uh, you put that into a large hip furnace and consolidate it and it becomes a solid components such as the ones that are shown on the right hand side of the screen. Um, we believe it will allow you to produce components in a much shorter turnaround. We think probably in the order of around three to four months. If this is set up in a factory line environment, it may be even shorter. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this over probably the last nine years. I show seven on the slide, it's actually about nine. Uh, and it's ideal for multiple penetration applications where you have a reactor pressure vessel head or a CNV head where you're trying to produce something that uh, eliminates a number of the welds in the components. So that's really the key factors around why we're looking at powder metallurgy and hot isostatic pressing. Another key attribute of it is it does allow you to produce a very homogeneous component. So you minimize uh, issues that you have with inspection of things like raw products or cast products or even forge projects, products in some applications because in all three directions you get a very homogeneous component. And I did mention that it allows you to eliminate some welds in certain applications and I'll show that to you on the next slide. Last part of this, it is roughly equivalent in cost to a forging. So let me show you what we're doing in the program. The uh, this is uh, uh, where we're actually manufacturing part of the upper assembly, which is shown in the center, center of your uh, slide. This upper assembly has roughly 27 penetrations. We've produced this at a 44% scale. It's made from 508 material. Uh, the total weight on this is around 3,650 pounds and the diameter at 50 inches is at 44% uh, at scale is about 50 inches in diameter. You can see the photograph on the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is uh, a component that we're producing right now or have produced uh, in a large hip vessel in the US, uh, the largest hip vessel available today. We do need a larger hip vessel to actually produce this at full scale or even at two-thirds scale. So we're currently working on that. I also want to point out the DOE project number that's shown at the bottom of the screen. So that's the reason we're looking at powder metallurgy. This is technology enabled us to make this large component at the bottom of the screen in roughly uh, about a four-month period. This is one monolithic structure. It's still in the can or capsule that's been produced for it, that would have to be machined away, but the, the can, uh, the, the component is one solid part. So that gives you some idea of why we're looking at powder metallurgy. There's a number of advanced welding technologies that are also available that we, I'd like to introduce and then talk about what we're doing in the, the small module reactor project. Uh, the first is, is electron beam welding. Uh, Electron beam welding will be discussed on the next slide, so I'll just hold off on that. Uh, adaptive feedback welding is a project we're looking at uh, to enable you to make changes real time in the overall welding process. That's kind of exemplified in the upper right hand photograph. Uh, here you're seeing uh, a weld actually being performed real time and actually being able to hopefully identify when flaws like lack of fusion or porosity exist. We're still working on this project. Uh, a lot of this is being conducted with the University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Labs. There's friction stir welding, which is shown in the bottom uh, uh, photograph. This is a uh, 
a, a new technology that's primarily being addressed for surfacing and healing crack, cracks. Uh, and then hot wire laser deposition or welding, which is shown on the bottom left, this is a technology that's actually being looked at by Westinghouse. Uh, they've actually set some of this up at, at our EPRI facility in Charlotte, and we've been looking at capabilities there. So there's a number of welding technologies, joining technologies that are also being considered for small modular reactor applications. The one I really want to talk about is electron beam welding, and this is an area I think is going to be produce a huge amount of savings for uh, manufacturing processes. Uh, specifically, why are we looking at electron beam welding? Electron beam welding is a one-pass methodology. Uh, so instead of requiring dozens of passes to uh, produce a weld, you can actually produce it in one weld, one pass. There is no filler material required. It's basically an autogenous process. So you eliminate any issues associated with uh, embrittlement when that is actually exposed to irradiation further down the road. Many of the current reactors uh, utilize uh, filler materials. Those filler materials in certain cases over time do tend to lose a little bit of their toughness because we're eliminating filler material. We do not have that drop in overall toughness or embrittlement. Electron beam welding can produce welds uh, with a very minimal heat affected zone. Uh, and our goal in this project is to be able to produce 110 millimeter thick welds. That's basically four and three eighths, or four and three eighths inch thick uh, welds, girth welds for the reactor pressure vessel in about 60 minutes. Now, do you say is that possible? Well, if you look at the upper right hand slide uh, side of the slide, you can see the uh, a large weld that was done in about 10 minutes. This is a 65 millimeter thick weld that's about three millimeters in length. Uh, the welding time for that was less than 10 minutes. Uh, if you look at the bottom screen, this is a large electron or a large vacuum chamber that's used for electron beam welding. In fact, this is what we're working with Nuclear AMRC on today, uh, wherein we're assembling portions of the upper and lower assembly of the uh, two-thirds scale reactor. I do also want to point out one other area that we're looking at is uh, in addition to the overall savings around uh, electron beam welding, we also believe that there's a potential to eliminate some of the inspection issues around this, and I'll touch on that a bit in the code discussion shortly. This is an electron beam weld that we've done as one of the mock-ups in the small module reactor program. Uh, again, this is about a six-foot diameter vessel. The flange is a little bit larger than that. We've been able to complete this weld in about 47 minutes. That's a, a real game changer if you can perfect this technology to where you can apply this time and time again, and that's what we're currently working on. The uh, assembly on the bottom right actually shows the lower head. This is flipped upside down, so you have a lower head that's shown on the top of this uh, photograph, you have the shell, and then you have a large flange. There will be two major girth welds in this, one that connects the upper head to the shell, and then one that connects the shell to the flange, which is kind of shown here on the left. So that's why, again, we think electron beam welding has real potential to help us in this area. Let's move on quickly. Diode laser cladding is another technology we're looking at. Uh, it allows you to significantly uh, reduce the amount of material that you're applying in terms of overall deposition rates. ASME requires, I think, somewhere around two to three millimeters. Uh, we can produce uh, thicknesses on the order of three to four millimeters with this technology as kind of shown on the bottom right and uh, in the cross-sectional photograph on the bottom left. Uh, we think that we can get this to where we can apply it with where you may not have to do any machining of the cladding itself such that uh, uh, you can get better inspection or uh, allows you to have ease of inspection. Again, I want to point out one of the key attributes of this is that it requires a lot less material in terms of overall application. So volumetrically, you're not putting down as much. If you're putting down a nickel-based material, 
Uh, you certainly want to minimize the amount of material that you apply to reduce overall cost. Uh, so I'm going to skip away from the discussion on small modular reactors now and then talk about a couple of other technologies that are being used, worked on. Uh, these include laser powder bed fusion, additive manufacturing technology, and direct uh, energy deposition technologies, which is also an additive manufacturing technology. We don't see this as being used extensively for small modular reactors. However, we do believe there will be certain components that are produced using uh, additive manufacturing technologies. The first one, laser powder bed fusion, typically uh, is produced by uh, utilizing a powder wherein that powder then is rolled over a component and a laser or electron beam source actually builds that component layer by layer. We think the components that uh, we will see produced by this will include very small components, typically components that are less than 50 pounds in size. I like to think of this as about the size of a microwave. If you can put something in a microwave, you could actually build it with this technology. It's about that size. Uh, so small valves, T's, Y's, number of fuel assemblies and fuel handling equipment, things like that could be produced with this process. Directed energy deposition allows you to build a little bit larger components. I'm going to say roughly up to 500 pounds. Some may argue that it might be a little larger. We've been doing this type of technology or this type of welding for 30 or 40 years. The difference today is it's coupled with robotics and computer controls, which allows you to produce components like you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, it can use powder or it can utilize wire. Uh, there are a number of nuclear applications, again, that are shown on the left-hand side of the screen, and I think we could uh, utilize this technology to produce things, things like pipe attachments or small nozzles, penetration tubes, uh, hard-facing surfacing, which has been utilized for already, turbine blades and journals and discs, which has also been utilized for by, for many years. So those are the kind of technologies that we think directed energy deposition additive manufacturing can be used for. I'd like to kind of close out the discussion here with a brief talk about advanced machining and metrology. Uh, there are three technologies that I think are useful to look at here. Uh, the first one is shown on the bottom left is, is metrology, where you're actually being able to go in and scan components and get a exact uh, numerical value of what that component looks like. That's very important in terms of machining applications to be able to set up and machine things quickly. Or in the case that's shown here, this is one of the halves of the uh, reactor, the lower reactor head that we're working on, uh, where we're actually getting a very good numerical uh, uh, picture of what the overall assembly looks like and did we meet final dimensions. There's also uh, ultrasonic machining, which is shown in the center, uh, which can allow you to essentially eliminate uh, or minimize heating of the uh, component as you're trying to produce, trying to machine it and minimize heating of the head, uh, the machining head itself. And very similar to cryogenic machining, wherein typically you introduce nitrogen at the head of the component uh, or head of the uh, machining tool, again, to minimize the heating that goes into that tool, uh, which allows you to increase overall deposition rates. So those are a number of the technologies that we're working on uh, within, within and without the, uh, out of the uh, small modular reactor program. Uh, there are a number of advanced manufacturing technologies that are available to industry today. I certainly couldn't touch on all of them in this very short time, but those are five or six that we lo are looking at. Which methods do we think are near term? The ones that are shown at the bottom, powder metallurgy and hot isostatic pressing, electron beam welding, cryogenic and ultrasonic machining are the key technologies that we think are gonna change industry in terms of small modular reactor applications. Again, I wanna emphasize that there are a number of partners and a number of organizations that are working 
on the current small mod reactor program that DOE and EPRI are sponsoring and nuclear MRC and new scale power. So that kind of brings me to the conclusion of my discussion around small mod reactors. I want to change gears just a little bit then and move over to codes and standards and what's necessary from a codes and standards standpoint uh, for looking at small modular applications where we're using some of these advanced machining or advanced uh, manufacturing techniques. So the next five minutes, I'd like to talk about electron beam welding and heat treatment and how we look to bring those forward in terms of code space, powder metallurgy and hot isostatic pressing, and then laser powder bed fusion again. Each of these I just introduced, but now I'd like to show you where we're going to utilize these in terms of code space. So in the current small, manufa small manu uh, manufacturing and fabrication project that we're working on with DOE, there are a number of technologies, a number of things that we're looking to do here. Uh, specifically, we're trying to develop supporting test data and information that we can utilize in going forward with code cases within ASME. The first of those is looking at acceptance of the electron beam welding process coupled with heat treatment. So localized heat treatment to allow us to, uh, to uh, produce a structure that uh, essentially has, uh, is essentially brought back to the same structure as the original component. So in other words, if you're working with a 508 material, you do an electron beam weld on it, you do a full heat treatment on it, it allows you to bring it back to essentially a virgin condition. Uh, so we'll be working with uh, section uh, 11 and, and or, uh, section nine and uh, section three in this case. Uh, we'll also be introducing powder metallurgy, uh, which we're currently working on in terms of trying to bring that forward within ASME space. Currently, 508 is not recognized within for powder metallurgy applications. We'll be trying to bring that forward within section two. This next slide has a lot of the pertinent information around uh, electron beam welding of thick components and some of the things that might need to be considered. I'm not gonna go through this slide except to say if you get an opportunity and wanna know more about electron beam welding and where it applies within ASME uh, space, this is where to go look. Uh, what I will touch on is, is the next slide. Uh, where, in terms of electron beam welding, can we actually perform that today on components? We believe that you can perform it on components uh, per section three and per section nine, uh, as shown on the right hand side of the screen. Can we actually perform it with a uh, localized solution heat treat? Today, I'm going to say possibly. We've got a, some development to do around that. Now, what you see on the bottom of the screen here is an electron beam weld that's shown in the upper part of the photograph. And then the lower photograph is one that's actually went through a solution anneal, quench, normalization, and temper. And that basically eliminates any evidence of the overall weld itself. So the question is, can we utilize this to minimize or reduce the number of inspections that are performed in service? Clearly, you'll have to do a fabrication inspection, but could you do that as an in-service inspection? So uh, later on, or, or, or eliminate some of those in-service inspections. Some of the information that's shown on the right-hand side of the screen, I'm not gonna go into this, but it, it does allow you to address post oil heat treatment issues at a slightly different manner than what we might look at for a stress relief, which is what we utilize today. Powder metallurgy hot isostatic pressing. Again, uh, we do not have the ability to, we do not have 508 recognized by SME section two. However, we do have a, a mandatory appendices that's utilized within section two that provides you guidelines for approval of new materials. So if we bring forward a new material like 508 material as a PM hip component, uh, we would bring that forward with a data package that includes a lot of microstructural mechanical data, welding data, and so forth, 
or a code package. So that's something we're currently working on within the uh, SMR project that we're addressing with EPRI and DOE now. Lastly, for laser powder bed fusion, we are there's a specification within ASTM that's, that's currently available. It's F3184-16. It allows you to address 316L stainless steel materials. Uh, the specification is pretty broad and pretty general for nuclear applications, however. So EPRI and DOE are working on a project together with Oak Ridge National Labs, Westinghouse, Rolls-Royce, Auburn, uh, Auburn University, and Orlicon, which is looking to produce laser powder bed uh, fusion components with 316L uh, and then go through the characterization and development of a data package and a code case. We expect to submit that fourth quarter of this year. Uh, so there's a lot of work also ongoing on this. I haven't really talked much about it, but uh, we've made three major components. Each of these organizations are producing components. Those are being sectioned and uh, the mechanical and microstructural data is being assembled into a data package. And then the code case will be assembled later this year. So with that, that's a lot of information I've thrown at you in a very short period of time, and I think I'm about over time at this point. I'll turn it back to uh, Bob and Kevin. Thanks very much there, David. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the information. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot, but at the same time, I'm sure people would rather receive a lot of information than a little bit. So, um, yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much for that. What I'm going to do is I'll pass over to uh, Chana now. Uh, it's great to see that we are having so many questions. Um, please do keep them coming in. We will be firing them at the um, panelists at the end. And like I said, if not, then we will ask the panelists those questions um, after the webinar. So please do submit as many questions as possible. So yeah, again, thanks very much, David. And Chana, um, we are going to swap over to you. Oh, one second. Yeah, Chana, we will just swap over to you now. And um, yeah, thanks very much, Chana. Off you go. Okay, um, hello everyone. So my name is uh, Chana Nagaswaran. I work in uh, TWI in the uh, inspection department. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you specifically about the uh, ultrasonic inspection of uh, weld overlay cladding, um, which is something that uh, is a part of the um, fabrication processes in, uh, in the nuclear industry. So the primary issue for uh, for inspection um, is is the the microstructure that develops uh, during the weld overlay deposition process. And here I have a diagram that depicts typically uh, typically a carbon uh, steel backing, which could be a vessel or a pipe, um, with a two uh, two pass deposition of a CRA layer. In this case, a 316 uh, stainless steel. And what you can see is the difference in microstructure between the carbon steel and the cladding and the the, the large grains of course uh, textured grains that develop uh, in in the cladding is the primary reason for for the inspection issues that are often but not always encountered uh, with with these type of components uh, and note also this uh, the the interface between the the carbon steel and the cladding which uh, which you uh, see later on in the in the data so the current strategies that we follow for developing a, an effective technique is really a pragmatic uh, uh, view, which is to, to uh, base the, um, the selection process on, on past experience and, 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 uh, and, and a set of reasonings, which I will go through in, in the following slide. But first I'd like to kind of illustrate or try to illustrate with a, with a simple model um, what happens in carbon steel when a wave um, propagates through it. So carbon steel is uh, described here as a fine grade polycrystalline isotropic material with with a uh, with fairly small refined grains. And when a sound wave, which I'm representing by a uh, what looks like a wave, uh, travels through it, what it essentially does is it picks up a lot of those grains and, and, and shakes it and, and that and, and in that way it propagates through the material. But when you are looking at the cladding. So when, when that sound moves into the cladding, you have a, a slightly different uh, material through which it has to propagate. And it's a coarse grain material, as I said, with a, a strong texture, which 
in this case is represented by the different colors of these grains. So if you take the same wave uh, and the wavelength of the wave trying to move through this material, it now has to shake um, a much larger set of um, discrete objects, uh, which which then need to uh, need to basically um, uh, vibrate against each other. So there are some consequences to this, and these consequences are, first of all, you, the, the the rubbing, essentially a kind of rubbing between the grains, gives rise to backscattered noise. So you begin to see noise in the signal that you receive. Uh, from the, from the cladding, uh, then there is the consequence of because you are uh, sending energy backwards in the direction in which the wave came from, you lose that energy which is registered as uh, attenuation. So your wave loses its uh, amplitude. And then thirdly, the uh, anisotropy of these grains, the fact that the the, the wave has to uh, travel through different elastic mediums across the boundaries essentially means that the energy, the vector changes, which means that it's uh, it, that the sound beam is distorted. Um, and all of these effects can be seen in both cladding, but also in, uh, in, in oscillating wells. And there are a lot of thick section oscillating wells, which, which you will find in the primary circuit of, uh, of uh, PW wells and certainly in SMRs. So, as I said, a pragmatic approach will will require an understanding of the of the key parameters, and one of them, as I said, illustrated earlier, is the wavelength. So, essentially, if you can make the wavelength larger with respect to the grains, whether that be the carbon steel grains or the grains of the cladding, then you can improve the efficiency of the sound propagation. So again, that depends on the coarseness of the grains, uh, and and the coarseness of the grains themselves depend on the process. So if it's a, a, a manual metal arc deposition, for instance, it can often lead to much a larger grain growth than an automated tick process. And certainly laser cladding will have its own um, morphology, uh, microstructural characteristics. And then the, the texture that, uh, that develops across the boundaries of these grains has a big influence on the level of signal to noise. And signal to noise is an important parameter for determining the quality of a technique because Ultimately, it, it also has a bearing on what kind of a flow or how small a flow you could be sensitive to. So what we tend to do is to try and say, uh, okay, so we start with a, uh, a known typical frequency such as 4 megahertz, and then from there we lower the frequency in order to get sufficient um, signal-to-noise performance. Uh, we always try and work with single element probes, so conventional UT and the standard beam angles wherever possible, because it, it, it's cheaper. Um, but we also consider the, the use of shear wave, which is the standard well-testing wave mode. But then we move on to longitudinal wave mode, because it, it, because it gives a larger wavelength for the same frequency. But if sufficient capability is found, then a conventional inspection is often uh, recommended for, for large area mapping using encoded or automated scanning systems. Um, but if, if if large areas need to be done so in in, in, in a fast way, then in in the current um, technological environment, the phased array instrumentation is is also uh, an increasing um, option. Uh, there are there are there used to be some issues with codes and standards, but those are essentially have been addressed over the last few years. So the uptake of uh, this uh, technology in the in the market in general has uh, has uh, skyrocketed. So generally speaking, uh, for an, in an inspection program, you need to define a good technique. And all, all the things that I've been talking about so far is primarily about uh, finding and designing a good, sufficiently good enough technique. But that technique also needs to be encased in a procedure that allows someone to, to implement it in an effective way. And that Implementation has to be done by operators very often, but it could also be uh, automated scanning systems. But the operators will always be there in order to to execute those uh, inspection campaigns. So they need to understand and they need to be trained in how to implement that procedure and the technique contained within. And that whole system of the operator, the personnel, the procedure and the technique needs to be qualified. And in the nuclear market, qualification is an important step. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that is um, that is well 
um, well considered during the fabrication as well as the in-service uh, scenarios. And all of those then need to be covered by the governing standards and codes. So it's a fairly complex and involved uh, situation when it comes to inspection of, uh, of nuclear components uh, in particular. So for osmotic wells and cladding, um, the, the standards that we typically work with are uh, the uh, ISO 13588 for phase the race, the 22825 for nickel alloys, 17405 for cladding. Uh, the qualification is often done uh, in Europe to the European Network for Inspection Qualification Framework, which is a uh, which is a framework, which is a set of guidelines essentially that allow a physically reasoned approach to to um, to qualifying the inspection program. Uh, the operator training is often done to the specific procedure. So, of, of course, uh, operators need to go through the certification training program, which is fine. Uh, but for for an effective inspection, there needs to be additional specific procedural level training of those operators. And that is often often found to be lacking in many industries, but in, in, the, in the nuclear industry, traditionally, that has been better, better addressed. The procedures need to be clear, concise, and it has to provide step-by-step -step instructions for the uh, operation of the equipment, uh, recording of the data, and how to interpret that data. And of course, finally, but not in any way least, the, the acceptance criteria must be carefully defined. Um, but the acceptance criteria for um, for oscillatic material for the cladding and welding is, is not straightforward um, when compared to carbon steel. And this is, again, due to all those issues that I talked about earlier, such as the, the attenuation, the variability in the sound propagation due to the anisotropy uh, and, the, and the signal to ne uh, signal to noise levels that may be adverse in, in many cases. So calibration and the sensitivity for the inspection often requires reference specimens. So these are specimens that have to have followed the exact fabrication methods that are that were used to create the, the component that you're inspecting. So this is different in, in, to standard inspection of carbon components, where standardized calibration blocks exist and are often quoted in the procedures for them. And finally, the amplitude thresholds, which are often used to establish whether an indication is acceptable or not um, can be difficult because of the noise, because the response at different parts or at different points of the inspection uh, scan plan uh, can uh, have different um, levels of amplitude. So it, basing the, the um, sizing in particular on amplitude levels can be, can be difficult. So, People often seek the diffractive signals from cracks, for instance, as a, as a critical form of a flaw, uh, but that itself uh, is masked often by the signal to noise, which, uh, which is why it's such a key parameter. So <clears throat> moving on to a case. So in this case, this is a case uh, on pipelines, so oil and gas pipelines. And this is something that we have done a lot of work on, and there is a lot of data, and there is a lot of qualification validation effort that has gone into it. And so here I'm showing you a tool uh, specifically designed for inspecting the cladding, um, which em employs four probes, one generating a shear wave, one generating a longitudinal wave, and another one generating a, uh, a two-probe longitudinal system, which I'm not going to try and describe here. And then the idea of the operator with the tool, with the probe system, and implementing the analysis on a, on a portable instrumentation, which can also be automated. So this system, which we've turned Club View, is m made up of four probes, but it is capable of running uh, six independent and uh, distinctly different techniques. Uh, and it has been validated over a specimen set with uh, 120 flows, over 120 flows, um, in, in a weld overlay cladding, in an alloy 625 cladding, uh, using operators who inspected it blindly uh, and then inspect and then reported and then the specimens and all the flows, both intended and unintended, were then salami sectioned according to a, a specific document that's often used in the submarine uh, pipeline industry um, to create probability of detection so, so that we can establish exactly how the likelihood of detecting different kinds of flows and, and different sizes of those flows. Because this particular pipeline is part of the subsea riser system 
and it, it is fatigue critical. And that work was funded by the Pipeline Research Council um, of, uh, in, in the US uh, under MATS 1-1 one, one one program. Uh, and it's going to be presented in detail in Houston in March. So I can't release a lot of the detailed information about it. However, I can illustrate how the, the, the data looks. Um, for, so for he, here is, a, is one of the ways of using the probes uh, using uh, an imaging technique called FMCTFM. And here we have an instrument that is um, operating the probe, and there you can see the, the signal from a specific floor under the, on, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline. So when, when, you look at the, when you look at the cladding with uh, the shear wave, what you see is, is that is, there's a lot of backscattered noise that is generated. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but my cursor is pointing out, this white line is pointing out the back wall, so the inside surface of the cladding. Um, this tool is applied obviously from the outside surface of the pipe, uh, an inside surface of the cladding, and then this cursor represents roughly the position of the floor, and then the, the cladding itself was about five millimeters in thickness, so it goes from 25 here up to about 20 there. So that's the nature of the cladding. And what you see is the, the noise, uh, backscattered noise from the cladding. So that's the shear wave. If we look at the same floor now with the longitudinal normal wave, what you see now is uh, the, the back wall, a very strong back wall, uh, and then you can see a signal there from a one millimeter notch uh, from the inside of the, of the cladding. And what you can see also here, these dots are the interface between the carbon steel and the, and the cladding. So the, those signals, those interface signals are, are, are useful for establishing the, the, the thickness of the cladding, but they also illustrate the changes in metallurgical condition, which gives rise to, to the echoes from, uh, from that boundary. If you look at the third technique, the DLA technique, what you see is a a uh, much cleaner sound. So here the signal to noise is much better. You have much reduced noise. Uh, and you can also see uh, uh, the, 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 the signal here. And it is actually possible to, to do some form of, uh, of the through wall sizing. But in our procedures for this kind of inspection, we, do, we don't uh, specify sizing um, because that is not well um, conditioned because, for, because of the, the skewing aspects of the beam. Because we, we cannot be sure of the sizing, and that's an area that is a piece of ongoing work um, that we are resolving. Similarly, when we look at the two millimeter notch cladding, you see a, a lot of noise in the, uh, in, in the shear wave channel, and of course you can't see anything, you can't really resolve the, the flow itself. Uh, but once you move to the longitudinal wave mode, you can then now see the, the, the signal from the floor, which is where I'm circling with my, uh, with my mouse. Um, and then when you look at it with the, the, the DLA technique, you can see quite clearly that the two facets of that, of that floor allowing you to establish its, its extent. But noticeably, the, the, uh, the, the signal, the noise from the, um, the image is much reduced. And again, similarly, three millimeters, even though it's a three millimeter floor, it's very difficult to, to resolve that from the shear channel. But you can in the, in the, in the longitudinal normal channel and the DLA channel. So if you look at some of the, the, the governing standards and codes, they specify the longitudinal uh, zero degree inspection or normal inspection, as well as uh, some form of the, of the TRL or the DLA technique, which I'm illustrating here. And just to, just to, to give you an idea of how things look when you have no flow in, 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 in a specific area, here you have a case where you have no flow and you still get a lot of noise. So you can imagine if the if the operator was just given this image, it would be very difficult for them to establish the condition of the cladding. And similarly, if you had an image such as this, there is a possibility that there is a requirement for the operator to to look at every uh, point within the uh, within the um, within the cladding in order to make sure that there are no indications. So even though the signal to noise is better, there is a lot of signals to analyze. But once you move to the, the second technique, it's, it's simply a case of, is there a flow or is there no flow? So being able to, to, to improve these inspections in this way, you can, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, you can, you can implement rapid inspection programs for, for cladding, but not just cladding after it has been deposited, but in fact cladding while it is under deposition. So this, this is the kind of, uh, uh, developmental areas which uh, which is currently ongoing. 
So, um, for, because we've done quite a lot of work on this, that there is a number of clients who, who, are, who are operating or, or interested in, 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 in using this type of uh, solution. So what we've done is, uh, is to, to basically create a table which lists the different schedules of pipe, piping uh, pipes, which are primarily used in the oil and gas industry. And for each of those pipes, we have different um, uh, grades or, or models of the, of the probe, which, which is what is represented in this grid which has been designed essentially through uh, modeling um, and so what the client does is they send us the pipe size and the material specified which could be a vessel rather than a pipe and then you uh, correlate the wedge setup against this table uh, and then they often send us a, well they have to send us a, a representative sample which we make into a reference block for setting the sensitivity and write the procedures uh, check them on the reference block and then sign out those procedures and then deliver the tool to the client with the procedure, the reference block, and implement on-site operator training with, with which then they're able to, to execute their own uh, in-house in training um, inspection programs. And in addition to this, we are now, uh, which is not on this slide, we are also incorporating uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, inspection uh, data analysis so that we can aid the operator in classifying and detecting potential indications for for analysis because what we found is, is that we, especially in pipe mills, when pipes are being clad uh, and we are inspecting them online, we need to have a system that analyzes the data as it comes in and not wait until the pipe cladding has completed because we can have, we can set up a, a feedback system that allows for the processes to be uh, to be better better controlled. And these, these kind of technologies that we're developing primarily for the pipeline industry can also be applicable to the SMR industry because a modular construction will essentially be some form of assembly line where you have a number of components in, a, in, a, in, a, in waiting one after the other. So being able to, to inspect the, the fabrication as it takes place online, so at high temperatures uh, and, and in the conditions at which the, the welding takes place, whether it be electron beam, whether it be arc processes, then it gives you a significant advantage in that you don't have to, to go back to those processes for repair. So if something is going wrong with the process, then you can stop the process and correct those um, conditions and then carry on with the, with the much better cost-effective um, you know, methodology for fabrication. So in terms of the technology side, a few summary points are that a pragmatic approach often leads to sufficient capability um, for cladding and also for cosmetic wells. So they are often viewed as quite a difficult challenge and they can be a difficult challenge, but if you follow the right methodologies of, of reasoning them through, you can op often approach, arrive at a at position where you get sufficient performance. And uh, in this way, we've developed this uh, tool called the CladView for, for pipeline steel which will also be applicable to, to, to cladding in, uh, in SMR. Tool is available China, to China, 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 yeah. let, me, let, let me interrupt you. We're, we're, running, we're running kind of late. Uh, since you're on your summary slides, let's, let's go ahead and move to questions, and then um, if, if that's okay. Sorry to interrupt, but we're, uh, we're running. That's fine. Time. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Chana. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dan. I do appreciate, do appreciate your, uh, your input there. So we do have a few uh, questions. Yeah, sorry we are running a little bit over time. Um, I've had an interesting question here from Gary Duarte, which I'd like everyone to weigh, on in, uh, weigh in on uh, very quickly. So the question is, given the fact that um, your studies are mostly engrossed in the science and engineering sort of areas, do you think there is an important value for the SMR industry to enhance the accessibility of advanced reactors through grassroots education of the public? So, Bob, do you want to start on that one? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, I, I, um, I think the groundwork has been laid, in my opinion, anyway. I think the groundwork has been laid for small modular reactors. I'm not sure how much more grassroots um, uh, work that we need to do. Uh, certainly, certainly uh, in new education, uh, people coming up in uh, in universities. I think that there's always uh, uh, work to be done in the area of nuclear engineering. Uh, you know, we've seen a dwindling in the number of uh, number of people uh, that are registering and and, uh, and and completing degrees in nuclear engineering. So there is that. But uh, but because the small modular reactors are relatively similar to to PWRs in a lot of cases, I think that there is a lot of groundwork for them already. Brilliant. I, I, I think. I, 
I think I answered the question. I'm not sure though. Yeah, no, I think you definitely did that. I think, um, yeah, I think it's very important that we do engage people as much as possible, especially at the grassroots education level. Um, it's important for us, especially if we want to see SMRs sort of pick up a lot of steam. It's important that we do make them as accessible as possible. David, did you have something that you wanted to weigh in on there? No, I really don't. I think in general, uh, the education level on this is is probably far along already in terms of what we're using uh, for advanced manufacturing technologies. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, China, just a final word on that. Do you think things are sort of um, as they should be in the UK? I think there are certainly a very high profile for SMRs at the moment, and uh, I think the education will, will naturally follow. And uh, you know, as engineers get involved in the in the issues surrounding it, I think that will that will follow. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So, um, second question uh, was from uh, Javika Riznik. Uh, David, I think this one was aimed at you. Um, so it was, is the US NRC involved in these R&D activities so new manufacturing technologies will be certified or approved for nuclear applications? So we are engaged with the NRC in discussions around each of these technologies that we're working on. As we bring forward some of the ASME code cases and so forth, clearly the NRC is going to be engaged and understand where we're trying to go with these. Uh, we have quarterly meetings with the NRC to review the technologies and make sure they're up to speed. So, uh, yes, they're very much engaged in the overall picture here. Excellent. Great to hear. Does anybody else um, want to weigh in on sort of um, NRC activity in advanced manufacturing? No, good stuff. Okay. So, um, moving on, David, we had another one for you. Uh, this is from Asif Arastu. He said, what is the limit on the HIP vessel size in practice? Today's limit is 63 inches in diameter. We are working with industry look, looking right now to develop a 140 inch diameter vessel. So uh, basically twice the size, a little more than twice the size of what we currently have. That would enable us to produce the upper head, lower head, and steam plenum for the new scale reactor. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that, David. Uh, last question from um, Edward Knuckles. Um, we'll just quickly go with this one. So the examples given are primarily the reactor vessel and some primary components. So the question is, is there a clear idea of what percentage of the entire plant can be built using modular manufacturing techniques versus standard techniques? Um, has there been any comprehensive economic case studies that have been carried out? Certainly, I'm sure there are economic studies that have been uh, utilized to assess various components, whether they're on the balance of plant side or whether they're on the primary side. I'm not aware of those at this point. However, if you look at what we just discussed around electron beam welding, if you can knock 90% of the welding time out of the overall picture, uh, that's got to be a huge savings. Similarly, for powder metallurgy, if you can reduce uh, time for purchase of a component from three, four years in terms of large forgings down to three or four months, that's uh, a big game changer. changer. Definitely. Um, does anyone else want to weigh in on regards to the economic benefits there? Well, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll just add that. Uh, let me let me add real quick that I, I do know that there are uh, other uh, manufacturers, not necessarily in the large component, but even uh, for some of the smaller components like valves and uh, some of the other components associated with these piping systems that are interested and are working on uh, powder metallurgy uh, for valve bodies and other components. So I think, you know, in, in the long term that uh, these advanced technologies are going to uh, reduce cost and schedule for the plants overall. And I think it's certainly going to be beneficial to SMR. Definitely. I think I'll, yeah, I'd 100% agree with you there, Bob. Um, unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap things up there. Um, I do apologize that we ran a little bit over on the presentations. It would have been nice to have a, a longer Q&A session, but unfortunately we've run out of time. 
Um, so I did just want to thank everybody who has uh, uh, come on the webinar. Thank you very much to everyone who's attended. And thank you very much to our uh, panelists, Bob, David, and Chana. I think that was a really great discussion there um, regarding the advanced manufacturing in um, SMRs and how they can really help us cut our schedule time and cut our costs, which I think is a huge thing, huge bonus for us going forward. Um, so I just wanted to make everyone aware that you will receive the full recording of the, um, of the webinar. Uh, that will be emailed out to you very shortly. Um, and I will discuss with the panelists whether we can um, share presentation slides at all. But I just want to say a big thank you. And I want to remind everybody that this was produced in association with um, Nuclear Energy Insider and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, who will both be at the International SMR and Advanced Reactor Summit um, in Atlanta, 2nd and 3rd of April. So please do, if you fancy SMRs in any way, please do get um, on board with them because we would definitely, uh, definitely like to see you there. So, um, yeah, once again, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can see you again.